So we're starting a series this morning, and it's going to take me a little while to get this thing off the ground. Just bear with me as we're getting our speed up the runway so we can make our takeoff. But we're going to probably be here for about three weeks, okay? And so what I want you to know is that the, the title of this series itself is, For Such a Time as This. Amen? But today's message is specifically called, The King is Calling. Amen? I'm saying it again. The King is Calling. We're going to be reading out of the book of Esther, and we're going to start chapter 1, and we're going to read some various verses as we move through. I'll tell you, we're going to be in chapter 1, verse 5, starting, and I'm going to get us to skip down a little bit, but we're going to go ahead and start reading a little bit. Y'all ready? You got your Bibles at home? If you're on Facebook, you need to really just, I don't know if you can pause Facebook Live, probably can't, but you need to get up, you need to go get your Bible, you need to get your notebook, you need to get your pen. That's what I say anyway. You're in the comfort of your home. Don't fall asleep on the preacher. Amen. <laughs> Esther chapter 1 verse 5. It says, And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So there was a feast going on. Esther chapter 1 verse 9. We're skipping a few verses. It says, Also Vashti... The queen made a feast. So the king's got a feast, and now the queen is having a feast. For the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Esther chapter 1, verse 11. So then the king ordered something. You ready? He ordered for them to bring Vashti, the, the queen, before the king with the crown royal. To show the people and the princes her beauty for she was fair to look on. I just want to stop for a little intermission right here. And I want to talk to you a moment about the fact that, that God's people, God's children are supposed to look different than the world around them. Amen. There's supposed to be something different about the countenance of the child of God. Amen. There's supposed to be something different. That there's supposed to be a different look on your face and in your eyes if you belong to the king. That's supposed to be noticeable, hallelujah, and look different than the world around you. People ought to be saying, what is it about you that is different than old boy or old girl over there? And you ought to be able to be ready, like God told uh, Peter, or Peter told the church, be ready to give an account for that joy that is within you. There ought to be a different look is what I'm trying to say. The king wanted Vashti, his queen, his bride, to come so that the people could see her fair countenance. So that they could see the beauty with which she had to offer. Amen. God wants you to look beautiful for the world out there so that they can see that there's something. Yeah. He wants you to be the one to lead them to the king. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 12. But. Isn't there always a but in the word of God? But. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlain, servants that worked for the king. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Can I tell you that this morning that King Ahasuerus is kind of like a type of Christ, like a type of God, because there's a kingdom and he's a king over his kingdom. So whenever I talk to you about this king, I want you to think of your king. His name is Jesus this morning. And I want you to know that Jesus has done everything that needed to be done for people to be able to come to him, for them to be able to hear the word and the decree of the king, for them to be able to experience the presence of God and the hope of God. But even still, mankind refuses to come. And it causes an anger and a sadness and a, probably a multiplicity of emotions on the inside of the king. On the inside of God, God himself, the word of God teaches us that Jesus wept when he saw the pain of the, of the cause of sin, which is death, when Lazarus died. God has emotion. There's been times whenever Jesus was angry. There's been times whenever Jesus exhibited joy and happiness. And there's been times whenever Jesus exhibited sadness. I'm here to tell you this morning that your life and your walk affects the way that the king feels. It says in verse 16... It says this, and Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti, the queen, has not done wrong to the king only. We've got a problem in the kingdom, sir. We have a problem in the kingdom. Because she has not only done wrong to the king, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. 
See, when we refuse to do what God is asking us to do, it harms the kingdom of God. It puts a bad taste in other people's mouths towards God, whether it's the fact that, that we are living in disobedience and sin or whether we are living our lives like a bunch of religious hypocrites. It doesn't matter because neither one of them are good. Because, see, you might be living your life in disobedience and, and sin and at the same time talking about the fact that you love the Lord. And sometimes that happens. Come on, children of God. Let's face reality. Ain't nobody in this house perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus is the only one that ever walked the earth without in, in, in perfection. Amen. But at the same time, God's not cool with us just constantly living a life of sin and never coming unto him when he summons us. No, God's not okay with that. At the same time, some people are like, man, I don't want to go to that church because they're a religious hypocrite. Uh, hello, wake up. And the world's always been filled with those types of people. The Bible's always been filled with those types of people. And sometimes what you call a hypocrite ain't even a hypocrite. What you think a hypocrite is somebody that says they love Jesus but doesn't live everything the way they're supposed to? No, that's what you call a Christian. <laughs> Christians fall. Christians fail. Christians get back up. Hallelujah. Because the word of the Lord says the righteous might fall seven times, but he gets back up again. He's going to get up in the grace and the power of the Lord. Amen. No hypocrite is one who wears a mask. He masquerades around. You turn anybody into a hypocrite if you look hard enough. Right. Hypocrite is, is saying one thing and he's living something else. Right. You don't know what's on the inside of that man or that woman's heart. What I'm trying to say is whether or not you're living in willful disobedience for everybody around you to see or whether or not you're sitting in the church like a religious hypocrite looking down your superior nose on everyone else, neither one of them is right. Amen. And instead of being there like Jesus and letting them know that God is there to bless them either way, we're AWOL like Vashti and God's kingdom suffers for it. She's absent without leave. She's supposed to present herself to the king. But she's like, no, I don't want to do that. Look at verse 17. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all the women so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported the king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti, the queen, to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia, verse 18, and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If she did it, then everyone can do it. Kind of like it's okay for people that say they love Jesus to keep doing whatever they want, even if it's against the will and the word of the Lord. Help us. Because when we make decisions to go in a particular direction that is opposite of the way of God, it causes contempt to the church. It causes confusion to the church. And just like the church age that we're living in now, everything's good. I can just do whatever I want. Don't tell me what I can do and what I can't do, preacher. No, that is not what the word of God says. No, that is not what the will of God says. Did you not know that you are not your own, but that you were purchased at a price? You were purchased with the precious blood of a lamb. Hallelujah. You don't belong to yourself anymore if you truly are a child of God. Amen. So there's some characters in this story that we're going to be introduced to in this first part of our series. The first character is King Ahasuerus. I told you already he's a type of Christ. He's a type of God, if you will. Amen. It's his kingdom. There's a Queen Vashti. You know what she is? She's the rebellious one. Whether it's a non-believer that doesn't want to receive the gospel, don't we know some of them? That's the ones that Jesus, come on somebody, help me out here. You, if you listen to the voice of God, you will begin to tell who the rebellious ones are. It doesn't mean, you know who a rebellious one is in my heart? Whenever I'm trying to talk to them about the Lord and they got a spirit in them of rebellion that is resistant to the word of the Lord. There's a lot of people that have not yet surrendered their life, but they're not resistant to the word of the Lord. They're, they're actually saying, give it to me. Give it to me. I want it. Pray with me. I want to receive it. They may not come the way I want them to come. They might not come as quickly as I want them to come. But I can feel it when there's a wall up and they're resistant to the spirit of God and the word of God. And the Lord said, don't cast your pearl before swine. Pig don't know what to do with the pearl. It's just a treasure of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He throw a pearl in a pig pen. He's going he's gonna, to he he's just gonna smash it all up in the mud along with his slop. He don't know what to do with a pearl. He can't eat that. Word of God, the gospel is a treasure. So Queen Vashti is the rebellious. She doesn't want to hear the command of the Lord. She doesn't want to come to the word of the Lord. Queen Esther is the obedient one. 
She's the child of God that hears the voice and the cry of God, and she comes to him, amen. And Mordecai, which we will be introduced to, is her cousin. He was older than her. He, is, he raised her in the ways of God, and he is a type of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a little bit of background information. The story of Esther occurs approximately 500 B.C., all right? So I'm just going to write that up here on the board. 500 B.C. So about 500 years before Jesus is ever born. This is when this story takes place. Now, there's a lot of background information. I got to get to, I'm getting the plane running. You ready? We're going down the runway. We're about to take off, okay? We're not quite there yet, but just bear with me. I got you a big old map up here of the Bible land, and I know I draw a map a lot of time. Way over here is the west. We're not over here today. This is Italy, and this is Greece. This is where all the churches of Asia Minor and the book of Revelation are located. We're not in any of these places. This is Israel right here, this little strip of land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Right here, this X, you know what that is? Come on, say it. That's Jerusalem. All right? So what I want you to know, though, is that the context here is that for uh, about 500 years, the children of Israel have been disobedient to the word of God. And God kept warning the children of Israel that judgment was coming on the land. He would send the prophet with the word of God in his mouth to speak forth the truth of God's word. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye the command and the decree of the king. Judgment is coming upon the land. Here is your opportunity to hear the word of the Lord, to submit to it, to surrender to it. But the people refused, like Vashti, the queen. They did not want to hear the pleadings of the word of God. Oh, everything's going to be fine. Everything's looking just hunky-dory. There's nothing for us to stress over. Everything's going to be just fine. But then the day came. When a man named King Nebuchadnezzar sent his armies from Babylon to Jerusalem and then he began to deport the children of Israel. Boop. Brought them from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now that looks like a nice little tick, but you know what that is? That's like walking from Homa to El Paso. <laughs> About 800, 900 miles. And it ain't no easy walk either, brothers and sisters. Daniel taken. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego taken. The children of God taken. Taken and deported and brought into captivity in a strange land. Can I tell you something this morning? That the place that we live upon is not our home. This place is a foreign land. This world does not belong to, to who we are. The hallelujah. You're a stranger and a pilgrim on this earth. And if you're looking to gain your fulfillment on this earth and from the things that this world provides for you, you're going to be sadly mistaken. Listen to me, child of God. The purposes of the people of God is to believe that God has a plan for them and that ultimately that plan is going to bring him glory and that you and I will be able to partake of that great and beautiful plan and that we one day will be able to see him come, Jesus come. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. If you're looking for everything today, I'm telling you, you're going to be disappointed. Amen. That's right. Lord, help us. Yes. Listen, I'm one of those people, I like, you think that I don't like something, come on man, I like exercising, I like nice clothes, I like wanting a spa, I like getting facials, does that make you feel weird about me, if you didn't want to shake my hand before, you probably don't want to shake, I don't care whether you like it or not, I like getting facials, I like getting massages, I like all the finer things of life, but if you think, I think for one second, that that's what's going to bring me fulfillment and happiness, no brothers and sisters, that's not going to do it, I need Jesus in my heart, I don't need a better a job, bigger promotion, better cars, better house. I need Jesus is what I need. Because let me tell you something, when times get tough and nobody knows where to turn, you better know how to get a hold of the Lord. You better know how to put your, where to put your faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified and to receive the flow of grace like a river that flows from the foot of Calvary to strengthen you, to empower you, hallelujah, so that you can walk this walk, this journey, even in the face of untoward Circumstances. So the children of God taken and deported to Babylon. And then after some time while they're over there, Daniel was now an older man. He was taken as a teenager. As an older man, the Persian Empire began to rise up in power. The Persia went over here, conquered Babylon, and took some of the people of God back with him over there to Persia. And that's where we are in our story. King Ahasuerus is a Persian king. 
But what's interesting is, is that God began to cause other Persian kings before him, Artaxerxes, Cyrus, to rise up and to give decrees that the children of Israel were now released to go back to their home country so that they could rebuild the temple, so that the house of God could be rebuilt, so that the sacrifices could be returned, so that the word of the living God could be broadcast again across the land because that's what God wants. But some of God's people chose to stay. Because sometimes when we get our, find ourselves back in the world, we get comfy in the world. Amen. We think that we're perfectly fine in the midst of the world. And I'm here to tell you that the world will never be your friend. And if you stay with me through this series, you're going to see as we continue to move forward that the world wasn't the friend of the Jew then, and the world will not be the friend of the Christian today. And let me tell you something. If there's a church in your community, and they're all buddy-buddy with the community, and everybody loves them, then there might be a problem. I'm not trying to say there is. That's for you to figure out. I'm here to tell you that the spirit of the world is in contradiction Amen. to the spirit of the Lord. The two of them are not the same. Amen. And if you're going to live for the Lord and if you're going to take a stand for the word of God, you're going to find yourself sometimes on the back end. You're going to find yourself sometimes being persecuted. But let me tell you something. Hold on, brothers and sisters. No matter how bad it gets, if I don't, I mean, I'm sure I'm going to see you Wednesday. But if I don't see you Wednesday, no matter how bad it gets, hold on to Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Keep your eyes focused on him. Don't let nobody lie to you. You better know what the word of God says. Hallelujah. Yeah. So before we go much further, I just want you to know Israel, this is spiritual significance. Israel's been disobedient to the will of God. Now they find themselves in captivity. They find themselves a prisoner and a slave. Do you know that when you open up the door to sin, you can find yourself a prisoner and a captivity to slave and bondage? You don't want to even be, sometimes, well, I don't want to be here anymore. Well, you better hold on to the Lord. The Lord will deliver you when he's ready to deliver you. Amen. Oh, but I prayed 10 prayers. I, I got on my face for five nights this week. Well, you better keep getting on your face, sister, brother. Because God will release you when he's ready to release you. Because sometimes you think you're ready to be released. And the reality of it is, is that you're not. And he knows you better than you know yourself. Because he knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows when a sparrow falls to the ground and dies. He cares so much more for you. If he's clothed the, the fields with the lilies of the, uh, and he made the, the, the fields more beautiful with the lilies of the valley than he even clothed Solomon in all of his glory, just think how much more he cares for you. So at the original time of the captivity, the Babylonians had taken this small country and had made them, brought them to this foreign land. And you know what? There are captivities and bondages and losses that are likely to occur. And there's even the likelihood that the believer who is supposed to be a stranger and a pilgrim will start to light the world in which he now lives. There's a possibility that like a frog in a pot of slowly heated water, he or she won't even realize that they're in bondage. Rather, they may believe that this is where they want to be. Lord, help us. That is some of the further context of this story because at some point the Persians rose to power like I just told you and they defeated the Babylonians. But God is always mercy. But some of those people, like I already said, they did not want to go back. It's dangerous to become comfortable with living in the world. We don't belong to this world. <laughs> I said it already, but the, some of the promises of God are not connected to the here and now. They're not connected to today. They're connected to tomorrow, to eternal life. They're connected to the fact that one day you and I will rule and reign with him. They're connected to being part of the eternal family of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 real quick. This is what it says about the, about the cloud of witnesses that has gone before us. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but they saw them far off and they were persuaded of them and they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They saw the promises of God. They believed in the promises of God. And even though they were far off, they kept their face focused on what God said that he was going to do. They never saw it with their physical eyes. They died believing. But at the same time, hallelujah, they said they considered themselves to be strangers and pilgrims on the land. Look at 1 Peter 2.11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. See, the world and the spirit of Antichrist have a whole lot of fleshly lust to offer the human body. Fleshly lusts feel good, but when you find yourself caught up in the midst of fleshly lust, you see what it does? It causes a war against your soul. Yeah. 
causes a war against your soul. It'll start to cause turmoil in the midst of your life. All kind of confusion and cacophony and chaos taking place on the inside of you. And I'm here to tell you that it's not God's will that you have a war going on in your soul. God wants to bring peace yes. to your soul. But in, the but in the story, even though the Persian kings had released, once again, some of them have gotten comfortable. God is more, let me tell you this. I want to say this. This is a good word right here. God is more concerned about your conversion than he is your comfort. That's right, I'll say it again. God is more concerned about your conversion than he is your comfort. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm not saying that's not you. You're missing my point. I'm going to show you what my point is. Look, let's look at Luke 22, 31 through 32. I said God is more concerned about your conversion than he is your comfort. You ready? Here we go. This is what I'm talking about when I use the word conversion right here. Here we go. The Lord said, so this is Jesus talking. When the New Testament said, he says, Simon, Simon. That's another name for Peter. He's talking to the great apostle Peter. The Lord Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desire to have you. Do you know that Satan wants your soul today? He wants, to, he wants to grab a hold of your soul and he wants to steal from you, kill you, and ultimately destroy you. He wants to destroy your faith and he wants to bring you to where he's going. He already knows where he's going, child of God. He thinks he's going to win. He's going to try to win. But no, he's already been defeated by Jesus at Calvary. But I'm here to tell you right now, he's licking his chops and he wants to destroy your soul. He says this, Satan has desired to have you. He Look at what he wants to do. He wants to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. And this is what I prayed, that your faith fail not. And this, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. See, the word sift means to grind or to agitate or to separate. I don't know. We don't even use them anymore. But I remember when I was a young kid, my mama had a flour sifter. You put flour in there and you turn this thing and it moved the flour around because they still didn't have refined flour back in the old days. And they had to remove some of the husk from the flour. And so what it did was it causes separation. It grinds you so thin that it causes separation. The enemy wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to call trial and tribulation and confusion and chaos. And he wants to separate you from your faith. But Jesus said, Jesus didn't say, oh, I'm going to stop him from showing up. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said this. He has, he has asked permission to have you. He desires to sift you. But this is what I'm doing for you, Peter. I'm praying that your faith fail. I'm praying that when you find yourself in the midst of the trial and you find yourself in the midst of the tribulation, whatever that looks like, whether it be personal or global, I'm here to tell you that I'm praying that your faith fail not. And that when you're converted, that you would strengthen your brethren. Amen. Hallelujah. When you're converted, you know what it means? It means to turn back to. It doesn't mean that you've never been saved. It means that maybe you were saved and like the children of Israel, you had gone in the wrong direction and you find yourself now living comfortably in the world. And the Lord said, no, I want you to be converted. I want you to turn back, turn back to me. And when you do, hallelujah. The Lord said, you want to do it. You want to turn back to me. And when you do, and I fill you with my grace, then I want you, want you to do, strengthen your breath. Yes. See, that's part of being a true child of God. When the Lord gets a hold of you, and you're going to know it because there's going to be a direct change in your life. Amen. You're going to have a desire to work for Jesus now. Amen. You're going to have a desire to prefer your brother greater than yourself. You're not going to look at life so selfish all the time. Oh, if I don't get what I want to get right now, and I'm going to throw a little temper tantrum, and I'm going to act the fool, and you're not giving me what I want, so now I'm mad. Quit crying. Pick yourself up. Put your boots on. Get up and go to work for Jesus. Hallelujah. And guess what? You'll learn how to truly find fulfillment because you'll realize that this world wasn't even all about you to begin with. Yeah. He was trying to figure it all out, thinking it was all about you. No, it wasn't all about you, man. And if you don't like the way that sounds, that means that you're probably full of egocentrism. You're self-centered right now. The Lord wants to move you away from self-centeredness. And like that song says, Jesus be the center of the church. Jesus, I can't sing. I don't feel the singing right now, but I'm going to, Jesus be the center of my life. Amen. I don't even remember the rest of the words, but that's what I'm trying to tell you. Not, not Jesus, make me the center of your joy. No. no, Jesus, you be the center of my life. You be the center of my world. You be the center of your church. Help me, Lord, to keep my eyes firmly focused on you. No matter how bad the storm looks, no matter how big the waves are, no matter how loud the winds howl, help 
me, Lord, to keep my eyes on you. Be the center of my life. John 16 and 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace in the world. You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, the world's going to the world wants to present tribulation at your doorstep. Yes. You ever had a, do a salesman knock on your door? What you offering today? I don't know why this came to my head. I guess I've been thinking about door knocking. What you, uh, what you got, what you got, sir? What you got? Uh, um, I represent the world. I got some tribulation for your life today. <laughs> the world is offering tribulation, brothers and sisters. Jesus said it. In this world, you will have tribulation, but oh, hallelujah, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Jesus has a source of grace and power and strength to infuse into you that no matter what you're facing, and I know I'm talking big today, and I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. He's got enough strength and power and grace to infuse in you, to rise you up, and to give you the power that you need to move forward like a soldier for the cause of Christ. As we move forward through the story, we will see a parallel to the Christian life. And the Christian story, we will see early on, like I just said, how the individuals are living in the midst of the world and how it will affect them. We will see moving forward how the enemy will further persecute them, how they will be stricken with fear as they face the fact that there are orders to have them rounded up and killed. I have to tell you that God's people have always faced persecution. The spirit of this world hates the spirit of God. The word of God preaches that as we near the end, there will be more persecution for Christians on the way. We will see how God will intervene and use Esther to stand up and speak the truth even in the face of danger. She will allow God to use her at a time when she is needed more than ever before. We had not even met Esther yet, church, but I'm here to tell you God's called his church to be an Esther. He wants you to be not just beautiful on the outside, but beautiful on the inside. And he wants to fill you up with something that you can speak to a lost and a dying world at a time such as this. He's called all, called all the Esthers to stand up and to speak the truth. Hallelujah. Thank you for Esthers. Amen. It's time to quit playing games with God. It's time to stand up and live for God and let those around you know that he is real and he saves and he sets free. It's time for you to walk in your purpose. It's not time to shrink backwards in fear to sit down or to shut up or to numb yourself with drugs, alcohol, or other types of sin that will allow you to escape your reality. Wake up should be the cry of the preacher. Wake up, be sober, and don't fall asleep in these times that we're living in. Amen. 1 Peter 5 8 through 10, starting in verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that in the world. Can I tell you something? I don't know if this is going to make you feel any better, but do you know they got Christians in China? Do you know they got Christians in Iran of all places? Do you know they got Christians in Italy? Do you know they got Christians in Egypt? Do you know they got Christians all over this world right now that are also feeling the affliction of what's going on? God wants you to know that you ain't the only one. God wants me to know that I'm not the only one. That the whole world right now is in the midst of chaos. And I'm here to tell you, don't that you need to wake up and we need to be sober because your adversary, the devil, is prowling around at a time like this. He wants to cause, strike fear in people's hearts. He wants to cause people's eyes to become focused on what they're facing instead of keeping their eyes on Jesus. Yes. I'm here to tell you that's not God's will. Mm -hmm. But the God of all grace who has called us into his eternal glory by Jesus Christ. Look at this. Come on, saints. This is the word of God. This is the kind of stuff the preacher don't read in church anymore. It says right here that after you have suffered a while. Sometimes we might have to suffer a little while. Amen. Can I say that again? Is that okay still to say in the church and since you're reading it from the yes. Bible? Amen. After you have suffered a little while that he would make you perfect. Yes. That he would mature you. That he would bring you yes. to completion. Yes. That he would establish you. That he would strengthen you. That he would settle you. Let me tell you why that happens. Because when you face trial and tribulation and you realize in your human weakness you ain't got no way out of this. You know what it causes you to do? It causes you to look to Jesus. Yes. And when you look to Jesus, no matter what you're facing, you might be the Apostle Paul in the Mamertine prison in the city of Rome under the rule of Nero. And they say, okay, boys, it's time to go get old Paul of Tarsus.
horses. Let him take the long walk. Put his head on the chopping block. Because today he loses his head because he refused to recant his profession for Jesus Christ. You might be and find yourself in a situation like Mark that wrote the gospel of Mark that bears his name. Being drawn behind a chariot through the streets of Egypt. All you had to do was just say you didn't believe Jesus really raised from the dead. All you got to do is just quit preaching this Jesus that you're talking about. And quit being an alarmist. Quit freaking everybody out. Quit telling everybody, oh, you better turn your eyes to Jesus because times are tough. Listen to me. The world one day, if it ain't today, it might not even be this year. It might not be in five years. I don't know. Uh, but I'm here to tell you there's going to be a day when it ain't going to be cool to be in the midst of Christianity no more. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to be like a little social guy. Amen. And we're going to have to make choices. Yes. On whether or not we're going to live for Jesus. I'm here to tell you today, the Lord will infuse you with strength and power yes. in yes. order to move on. After you suffer just a little while, yeah. this life is but a vapor, child of God. Yeah. At just a little temporary moment. Yeah. And the choices that you make today are going to affect eternity. Yes. Right. Lord, help us. When you breathe your last breath on this side, you're going to take your first breath on the other. Right. And that begins eternity. Help us remember that, Lord. Seal that on the inside of our hearts. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 through 7. I'm about to start preaching. You ready? I'm about to get to point number one. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 through 7. You are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep. See that in that song? Didn't y'all just talk about that in that song? First time they ever played the song. How does that happen? It's called the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Wake up. Amen. The Lord's saying something. Wake up. Hallelujah. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. There's other people fall, falling asleep. Oh, they might be waking up a little bit now, but are they even still going after the Lord? And listen to me. I'm, listen, I'm not pointing this at anybody that might be listening on Facebook. Don't think that I am, even if I had a conversation with you about it yesterday. That's not what I'm doing. But what I, one of the things that I've noticed in life is, is that even since people have entered the rabbit hole and started to look in conspiracy theories, sometimes people can get their minds so set on that. And I'm not saying don't look at it. I'm not saying don't pay attention to it. Some of it might be true. I don't really know what's right, what's wrong. I do know this, though. This is true. Amen. This right here will prepare you for whatever you got to face tomorrow. I'm going to stay focused on this. Hallelujah. And if you keep your eyes on all that other stuff, but you refuse to come to this, if you be like Queen Vashti and refuse to listen to the call and come to the summons of the king, you're going to be in trouble. Listen to me, child of God. If we can't live for him today, how are we going to live for him when he gets really, really, really bad? Oh, we think we got to figure it out. Oh, I know what's going No, no, no. You're going to need to have supernatural divine power and grace. In order to stand in bad times. Yes. Help us, Lord. Yes. yes. You are the children of the night, of the light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that are drunk are drunken in the night. Lord, help us. That's not just talking about being drunk. Yeah, you could be drunk on alcohol and, and miss what's going on. You could be taking drugs and miss what's going on because you you all caught up in your little euphoric world that's not a reality. Yeah, that's possible. But this is talking about spiritually. It's talking about waking up from your spiritual slumber. It's talking about waking up from your spiritual drunkenness. Y'all don't even remember that show, the Andy Griffith show, huh? Yeah. Hey, throw old, old. Yeah, some of y'all do because y'all old. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm saying I'm old too. And obviously, I remember it. Oh, Otis was the town drunk and they throw him in jail on Friday and they let him out on Sunday. He looked all clean, ready to go. You don't even know what he missed on the weekend. <laughs> don't fall asleep spiritually. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm, the preacher's old too. <laughs> 53, man. I'm getting up there. All right. Here you ready? Point number one. Y'all ready? Ready. Hallelujah. The king is calling. That's, that's the name of the, that's the title of the message. Point number one, don't ignore the call. Amen. Let's look at Esther chapter one, verse 19. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered. That Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Well, you call her Lord. You called her and she didn't want to come. So if she doesn't want to come, why don't you redirect your call 
to someone else. Give somebody else an opportunity. Look, there's a whole lot of theology in there that I'm not really going to go down, but let me just say this. God called out to Israel for thousands of years. She refused to come, and that's why that fig tree was withered whenever the Lord was on his way to Jerusalem. He said, I will take it from you, and I will give it to a nation that, that will do something with it, that will produce fruit. Therefore, the church was born so that the word of God could go forward, that the gospel Amen. would be preached. Amen? Amen. The Bible describes two types of people. One, those who hear the call of the king and respond, and two, those who hear but ignore Queen Vashti represents any person, whether they call themselves Christian or non-believer, that have heard the summons of the king and have chosen to ignore the voice of God. The root cause of her response appears to be the fact that she just simply did not want to be bothered with what the king wanted. Come on, somebody, help me out. It's in the text. I didn't make it up. She had her own feast going on, and what she wanted to do was more important than doing what the king wanted her to do. And she simply didn't want to respond. King says, I'm going to have a feast. So what does the queen do? I'm going to have a feast too. Yep. Now, my feast looks a lot like the king's feast. He wants me to do this, but I'm going to do that. And it kind of looks like what it is that he's doing, but I just want to do my own thing. I don't want to do what he wants me to do. Am I working pretty good on that little personality? Maybe? <laughs> There's a story in the New Testament where God describes this type of scenario just as in the Esther story. So in this story, there is something important for the king, but it's not important to the people. They hear the call, but they're not they're, they, they can hear, but they're not listening. They simply want to do what they want to do rather than what God is asking them to do. Matthew chapter 22, verses one through five. This is not something that was just born yesterday. No, this has been in the church. This has been in the people of God. This is still here today. Help us, Lord. Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage, but they made light of it, and they went their ways. One to his farm. Another to his merchant. This one going to their job. This one going to the spa. This one going to do whatever. It's I, I do whatever I want to do. I don't do what the king is asking me to do. We have to be able to be willing to clothe ourselves in humility. Amen. And to trust in the word of the Lord. Trust in the will of God. You see, unlike the Vashtis of the world that have no concern towards God, God has concern towards man. Yeah. He is interested in the well-being of his creation and he is inviting them to come. Hallelujah. He is calling them and pleading with them to come to him and not just to pray some prayer one time in a church somewhere. No, to surrender their life to him yeah. and to be married to him, to come when he calls. Look at John chapter 8. I'm sorry, John 6, 44. Jesus said this, no man can come to me except the father which has sent me draws him and I will raise him up the last day. Amen. See, you can't come unless he calls. God the father makes the call. His voice is the word of God. It goes forth through the mouth of the preacher. The preacher may be a man or a woman behind a pulpit or it might be a believer in Walmart. But the message of the king goes forth and the message states that you're invited to come into his presence. He summons you. Won't you come? And when the call goes forward, the spirit begins to draw the heart. Don't ignore the call. Don't ignore the draw of the spirit that you're feeling. Don't waste any more time. Today is the day of salvation. Give your heart to him today. Hallelujah. Amen. But preacher, I don't like the way that people act that say that they're Christians. They're hypocrites and self-righteous, so I don't want to come to the call. Well, I don't know what to tell you, boo. <laughs> There have always been people like that, and there will always be people like that. Get in the line with all the other millions of people that refuse to answer the call because of the fact that some irritation that prevents them from coming to the king. To save a little bit of time, in John chapter 5, verses 37, the Jesus said, The Father sent me. You look through the scriptures, for in them you feel as though you're going to find eternal life, yet the scriptures speak of me, but you won't come to me. The king is calling. Won't you come? Amen. Yes. It's 
It's always been that way. There's always been Vashtis, both in the world and in the church. There are people who don't want to really hear what the king is saying, so they keep themselves at a distance. This has resulted in a change to the call. Not really, a, the, the call hasn't changed, but man has changed the call. Such a change that it's no longer really the call anymore. It's more like the comfort. We prepare a place of comfort for you where you can come and perform your religious duties and we will parcel out portions of the word of God so that you feel comfy enough to come back. You don't really need to be challenged by the word of God and change. Instead, you can just be happy and do what you want to do. As a matter of fact, we will just do our own feast over here. While the king is doing his feast, we will do our own feast. It will outwardly look like the kind of like his, but it will really be ours and we will do it on our own terms. The message has changed so that the people can hear what they want and come on their own terms. But that's not how God's message works. We come on his terms because he is the king. Amen. You know, the result of these types of actions in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 3 in the, in, in the church of Laodicea, it shows that Jesus is on the outside coming in. He's not really knocking on the door of an individual heart. Yes, Jesus knocks on the door of the individual heart when the call goes forward. But in this text, in Revelation chapter 3, verses 19 through 22, Jesus is on the outside of the church. He's knocking on the door of the church and he's saying, won't you let me in? As many as I love are rebuked and chastened. Are you ready to be rebuked and chastened by the Lord? Amen. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. Jesus is on the outside of the modern church looking in and he wants to come in though. And he wants to let you know if you happen to be sitting in the modern church, he wants to know it. he's knocking on your heart. He wants to come in. He wants to sup with you. He wants to dine with you. In other words, he wants to be in fellowship with you. He wants to have a relationship with you. That was point number one. Don't ignore the call. Point number two, listen to the teacher. You ready? Bear with me. You ain't got nothing else to do. You're going to have to go home and sit in your quarantined house. <laughs> Come on, man. At least you get to look at some people today, right? <laughs> listen to the teacher. Point number two. Listen to the teacher. Esther chapter 2, verse 4. And let the maiden which pleases the king be queen instead of Ashtai. And the thing pleased the king. And he did so. Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. There's the spirit. He's the teacher, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. Remember, I told you all that. That's why I drew all that, because I was reading this. And I was like, man, I'm going to lose them. I'm going to start talking about another country, another time, another context. So I went ahead and drew you a map. So now you know where we are, right? All right. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful. Whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together into Shushan the palace to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also into the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women, and the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her things for purification with such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house, and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. Now let's just take one question quick second. She's in this place. I'm about to describe it a little bit better in a moment. There's a whole bunch of women in here and they're being prepared. They're being prepared to go see the king. You get one shot at this deal. Yeah. Yeah. You, you get, you get, they're prettying you up. They're getting you pretty to, to go see the king. One shot. So I want you to envision that. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, how I perceive it. But what we're seeing here is that Esther is Whatever, however her countenance is, and it's not just because of her physical beauty, because we're talking about a room full of physically beautiful women. Ain't not one in there that's not attractive. 
All right. So we're not talking about physical beauty, but something about Esther causes this servant to be moved towards her. What is it that you need? I'm going to make sure that this girl got everything that she needs. But then look at this last verse. It says, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show. She had not told who her kindred was. You know what kind means? My people, my kinfolk. She had not shown who her people were. In other words, she was a Jew. It's important. Mordecai, her uncle, told her, don't tell them who your people are. I don't know why Mordecai told her that. Nobody knew yet what was about to go down, but Mordecai felt in his spirit, don't tell nobody who you belong to. And so she did what she was told. All right, Esther chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king, king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. I want you to get a moment of that. We're about to, I'm about to break it down the way I see it. The Bible didn't say it like this, but I'm about to tell you my visual interpretation of what's going on. But right now, what you see here is that this woman said, I don't need anything else other than what you're giving me. Now, that's a beautiful picture right there for the child of God. Jesus, whatever it is that you have for me, I'm willing to surrender to your will. I'm willing to hear your voice, to surrender to your will. I, and all this other stuff that everybody's wanting, it may harm me. It may not be what you have for me. So, Lord, I'm going to, by your grace, surrender to your will and what it is that you're giving me. Amen. Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her and made her queen instead of Vashti. She found grace and favor in the eyes of the king. Look at verse 20. Esther, again, had not shown yet her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. She listened to his words just like when she was a little girl. Mm -hmm. Mordecai is a type of the spirit. He will tell her when to speak and when not to speak. He had raised and prepared Esther from her youth. God has given his spirit to the church so that we wouldn't be alone, so that he would have a so that we would have a teacher and be able to hear his voice. Verse 10 of chapter 2 said that Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. Verse 15 said she required nothing but what the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed, and when she trusted in what she was was provided to her from her king. Verse 17 says, and the king loved her above all the other women. When she was just willing to submit herself to the voice of reason, when she was willing to submit herself, not the voice of reason, the voice of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes it doesn't even make sense what the, what the Lord's telling us to do. But when she submitted to the voice of God, hallelujah, favor was obtained in her life. You need favor and grace in your life? You need to submit to the voice of God. Quit listening to what everybody else tells you. Quit listening to what the world of business tells you. Quit, they don't know the, the voice of your king. Look at verse 20. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. Unless you come unto me as one of these little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Dependent on the Lord. Willing to listen to the voice of God. See, I don't know if you can see it. This is what I want to prepare for you, a visual I don't know if you can see it, but I see it clearly. This picture that I'm seeing is a huge area filled with beautiful women. All these women are specifically chosen because of their physical beauty. I imagine that behind the scenes in the dressing room where all these women are, that they're having their makeup put on and they're all a bunch of divas. Now, I'm not picking on women. I'm just trying to get that. We've all seen it. We've all seen a diva type woman, right? Have we not? You know, high maintenance is what we call it, right? Y'all cool with that? There ain't none of y'all in here like that. Y'all ought to all be good, right? I'm not picking on women. Quit looking at me like you're crazy. All right? So we got a room full of these kind of women. And I can imagine that this head chamberlain has instructed the other ones on exactly what should be done in preparation for these women. After all, it is his job to prepare these women for the king. And he knows what the king is looking for. Right? But as the chamberlains start bringing the stuff, I'm talking about the makeups 
and, and the oils for fragrance and articles of clothing, the divas, which is like the people of the world, or the watered down church. Well, this is what they say. Ew, I don't like that color. I don't like the way that smells. I don't like the way that flows when I walk. I need some patchouli essence instead of just simplicity of lavender alone. I need a little more purple in that eye makeup. That color is too muted. I want my eyes to pop when he sees me. And as you scan the room, you see all these women making all these demands on what they want. And you can see all these chamberlains sending the servants under them to fetch new items for the divas. And when you look over in the corner, if you're willing to look in the right direction, and you can notice the most beautiful woman in the whole room. You would have missed her if you weren't willing to get your eyes off of what seems so important. And that's just like the gospel, man. And the hustle and the bustle of the world going on. And everybody's flipping through the channels and they see big old churches with gold chandeliers. All this big stuff and preachers in nice beautiful suits driving big old cars like, man, look at this. He got 25,000 people in his church. Surely he must be from the Lord. No, it don't necessarily mean it's of the Lord. It's a matter of fact that the enemy inspired men to create the whole seeker sensitive movement and the concept of the mega church so that a lying message could be filtered from the pulpit into the people's ears so that it would enter into their heart and that they would think that they're okay but then instead they're like a frog in a slowly heated pot of water and they're, and they're basically dying in the middle of that because they're being starved of the nutrition of God. They're not receiving the word of the living God and you would never even notice because you was all caught up in all this hustle and bustle and you would never notice that beautiful little Jewish girl over there in the corner because she's not making a fuss. She's not making a fuss. She's just She's just beautiful. And she got a beautiful spirit in her. And she just wants to hear what the voice of the spirit is saying to her and to humble herself. See, she was different from all the other women because she was a Jew. She was a child of God. She had been raised by her cousin Mordecai and he had taught her the ways of God. And while everyone is choosing to do things the way that they want to, she remembers the teaching of her uncle and she remembers the humility that she has learned. And I don't know if this part really happened, but this is how I imagine it in my mind. Others start to notice her beauty and the way she carries herself. And they begin to ask, where you come from, girl? <laughs> what province are you from? You look so different than everyone else. I don't know. You're just different. What's going on with you? Her response, just a little smile and listening to the instruction of Mordecai. My mom and dad died when I was young. I was raised by my cousin. I can't really say too much about all that. She had a teachable and a humble spirit. And the result is that, verse 17, the king loved Esther above all the women. She obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. You know, God doesn't have favors, but I'm here to tell you, it sure does bring pleasure to his heart when his child listens to his voice. Amen. Amen. Just as God made sure that Esther had a Mordecai to lead her and guide her in a direction that would allow her to experience grace and favor, God has given us the Holy Spirit to teach us his ways. Amen. Amen. Look at John 14, 16 through 18. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I will pray to the Father and he will give you another comforter. Listen to me, church. You might be finding yourself in the midst of disarray, but I'm here to tell you, God promised that he wouldn't leave you alone. He sent a comforter. The word there in the Greek is para on the side of Kletos, the one that's been called along your side to help you. You're not in this journey on your own. No, you might feel like you're alone, but I'm here to tell you that if you're a child of God this morning, then the Spirit of God lives in you, and the Spirit of God is with you, and He will lead you, and He will guide you in all truth. Hallelujah. Amen. He said that, He said this, I'm going to pray that He's going to send you the Comforter so that He may be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees Him not, neither knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you, and He will be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you, I'm here to tell you that the reason that the Holy Ghost can live in your heart is because of what Jesus did at the cross. Yes. Right. I can't make it no more simple than that. I said the reason that the Holy Spirit can live on the inside of you is because of Jesus, what Jesus did at the cross. Yes. And your continued faith in what Jesus did for you at the cross allows the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to have communion with you, to lead you and to guide you and to direct you. What you going to put your faith in, Christian? You better put your faith in the finished work of Jesus. Yeah. He said, it is finished and he released the Spirit of God. Listen to me, but now the resurrected Savior lives on the inside of you. 
He wants to walk with you. He wants to talk to you. And he wants to lead and guide you. And he wants to give you victory so that you can bring him glory on this earth. Amen. He's here to comfort you. He will never leave you alone or forsake you. The world may be full of chaos and catastrophe, but the spirit of God will be there by your side, speaking to you and providing for you exactly what you need to live in his kingdom. It will be up to you to determine whether what he has and offers will be good enough or whether instead you need something more to add to or to go get for yourself. Sadly, that's where the world lives. They don't have the comforter. Most of the church lives there too, always looking for something else to bring them comfort. The women in the room that wanted more didn't know Mordecai and couldn't hear his voice whispering like Esther did. Just as the world doesn't know the Holy Spirit and can't hear his voice, and just as the worldly church can't hear him either. But the Word of God says in John 14 that he, the Comforter, will teach you all truth. Yes. He will take up what is mine and he will show it unto you. The Holy Spirit wants to whisper in your ear and he wants to teach you. Hallelujah. When Esther needed it, the voice of Mordecai was there. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm going to go move. I scroll past about four more scriptures so I can get to point number three. It's 1102. You're going to give me seven minutes. That'd be pretty good. I think seven more minutes. You ready? Point number three. Here we go. Purification is a process for preparation. Purification is a process for preparation. You belong to the king now. You're being prepared right at this moment to see him. Yes. You're being cleansed upon this earth. In this journey that you're walking, you are being prepared to see your king. Esther chapter 2 verse 9. And the maiden pleased him and she obtained kindness. Talking about the chamberlain, not the king yet. She obtained kindness of him and he speedily gave her the things for purification. With such things as belonged to her and seven maids which were meet to be given to her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Verse 12. And when every maid's turn was come to go in to King Ahasuerus, after that she had been 12 months, according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of the purifications accomplished. It was six months with oil of myrrh, and then six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Now that word myrrh right there, I mean, it took a whole year for this to go down. So one thing I want you to know is that there's a process. Cleansing is a process. No, it's immediate. The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are cleansed, you are covered with his righteousness, you are cleansed with his blood. In the eyes of the Father, you're no longer a sinner, now you're a saint. But the reality of it is, and I preached this a while back, it, it took one day to get Egypt, uh, Israel out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. And you and I still got stuff in us. And we're in a process, a process of purification. And it starts with the oil of myrrh. Because myrrh is how they prepare dead bodies. We know that. It was one of the gifts that was given to Jesus by the wise men. Even in his birth, he was prepared. He had come to die. And I'm here to tell you that that's what God's looking for in his bride is that she die. That the old man born of Adam, born in sin, would die. And that a new one would now be purged, would now be, would be cleansed, would be purified. Hallelujah. And listen, you started off with oil of, oil of myrrh, but the last six months was about sweet odor. See, there's a new sweet fragrance to your life. There's a new sweet incense to your life. Hallelujah. Just like you're supposed to glow and be beautiful like Esther was. Amen. I'm talking about on the inside. You're supposed to also have a sweetness to your life. Yes. Lord, help us. Kill the old prayer. If we were, listen, I don't know about you, but I won't be sour no more. Amen. Sometimes I feel it. <laughs> I feel this all the while. Like, well, I'm telling you, I can twist off. Sometimes I get frustrated. I feel it rising up in me. I felt it rising up in me recently, last week. It was about right here. I felt like it was going to turn in red. But you know what? I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be sweet. I want to smell sweet. Yeah. The fragrance of the Holy Spirit is what I'm saying. Amen? Amen. Purification is re from sin is required if we're going to have a relationship with God. Sinful man cannot be in God's presence unless he is cleansed and made pure by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Look at verse 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. If you're watching on Facebook, are you still living in the world? Come on. If, you, if you're in the middle of the church, are you still living in the world? Because this is the message. I didn't write this. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote this to the church of Corinth. It says in verse 9, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. 
neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate. And boy, that message won't go over well in today's society, but that's the word of the Lord. You know what an effeminate is? It's talking about homosexuality. But it's not just talking about homosexuality. It's talking about a whole lot of other sin. So don't say he's picking, oh, he's picking all the homosexuals. Get him on Facebook. Do whatever you want to do. But let me say this. It ain't just talking about homosexual, self-righteous Christian. It's talking about a whole other kinds of problems that the word of God's got a problem with. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at this, how beautiful this is. And such were some of you. Past tense adverb. Such were some of you. See, you used to be that way, but that's not who you are anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Hey Amen. The old man born of Adam has died. Oh, but you don't know I messed up last week. That don't mean that's who you are. That's right. Yeah. It don't mean that God's okay with it, but it doesn't mean it's who you are. God changed your nature. Yeah. If you've been born again, God changed your nature. And you're in a purification process. Yeah. Yes. He says this, but you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus died on the cross to purify you. The oil of myrrh was laid upon you when you said yes to Jesus. And in the mind of God, you died, were buried. And hallelujah, the sweet odors of incense were placed on you when you resurrected from the dead. Hallelujah. I'm going to close with two scriptures. You ready? Isaiah 118. This is what Isaiah, the Lord said to the children of Israel. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as well. All you have to do, if you're listening by Facebook today, if you're in this room and you're saying, that's me, preacher, you're talking about me. I feel like my sin is like, is like scarlet. It's red. It's glaring. It's bright for, the, for everyone to see. It don't have to stay that way. Amen. It can become white. Yeah. It can become as pure as, as freshly cleaned wool. It can become white as snow in the eyes of God. God's saying, come, let us reason together. Won't you listen to my word? Won't you listen to my will? Romans chapter 3, verse 25. We're closing with this verse. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. What is that talking about? It's talking about a sacrifice. It's talking about a blood sacrifice through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. God has been having patience and finally he sent us Jesus. And I'm here to tell you this morning I got good news. I got good news, child of God, that no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, if you can recognize that your sin is like scarlet and crimson, I'm here to tell you, God, make you fresh and whole and make you new. All you have to do is call on his name right now in the name of Jesus.